Hello and welcome to the first English Today Business DVD. In our new story, On the Job, you'll meet two young career girls and with them you'll learn about company life and the language you use in the workplace. In each DVD, there's a program that focuses on job skills and describes modern business strategies that will help you to be successful at work. In this DVD, there are five episodes of On the Job, followed by the business skills program that looks at brainstorming techniques. Then, we'll look at how to talk about work, how to describe a company, its organization and its development. Finally, we'll look at how to talk about markets. So, enjoy your viewing. Oof. This report is so boring. Numbers, accounts and statistics. I hate it. I'm an artist. When I was younger, I used to write short stories, novels, poems, and I was good at it. What has happened to my inspiration? What am I doing here? A publishing house. That's where I would like to work. Okay, Victoria, stop dreaming. Let's get back to the report. The boss wants it on his desk at five this afternoon. Oh, isn't there anything more interesting to do? Like listening to some good music. Telephone. Hello, this is Victoria Lee. Oh, Lucy, what can I do for you? No, I'm not busy. Well, actually, I am very busy. I have to write a boring report for the boss. Anyway, what is it? Is there a problem? What? Mr. Lewis wants to speak with me. Really? Yes, yes, of course. Put him through. <clears throat> Good morning, Mr. Lewis. It's a pleasure to hear from you. How are you? I'm fine, sir. What can I do for you? Yes, I know the product. It's very interesting, innovative, and the marketing department thinks it has a lot of potential for the international market. What? Me? Really? Thank you, sir. Yes, yes, immediately. Yes, yes, Victoria, today is your lucky day. Bye-bye, boring report. So, you are Ann Baxter. Yes. Yes, I am. I'm sorry. Really, I am so sorry. Nice to meet you. I'm Mr. Stevens. How do you do? I'm so sorry, Mr. Stevens. Ann, please, sit down. It's all right. How are you today? I'm a little nervous. And this isn't a good start. That's all right. Well, Anne, where are you from? I'm English. I'm oh. from Oxford. Great. A true Brit. Can you speak any other languages? French, German, Spanish? I can speak French, um, a little Spanish, and a few words of Italian. My sister is in Rome studying history of art at okay. university. Okay, okay. Very interesting. And can you use a computer? The internet? I'm not a genius with the computer, but, but I can use one. Great, Anne. Uh, I have your CV here, and I see you already work here. What do you do exactly? I do this and, and that. Um, I usually work from home. Mm -hmm. I have an office in my room uh, with a, a big desk and, and two chairs. And fine, fine. That's, that's fine, Anne. Uh, do you live alone? 
No, I, I share a flat with my Australian friend, Alice. And there's a new flatmate now. His name is Jack. He's from New York. He's very nice. That's, that's fine, that's fine. Great, and you're, you're very well prepared. You, you have a good education, and you're very precise. You're just the person for this internship. Oh, thank you, Mr. Stevens. Thank you so much for this opportunity. Good. Now, let's see if you know the names of jobs and professions. I will mime a job and a profession. You try and guess what it is. All right? Number one. What's this? What's my job? Uh, ladies and gentlemen, what would you like to eat this evening? What am I? A waiter. Exactly. A waiter. Now, this one. What's my job? Difficult job. I'm a computer technician. A computer technician. Okay, next one. This one. What's my job? I'm a, I'm a? No, I'm not a policeman. I'm a policeman. A policeman. Be careful of the pronunciation. Next, what's my job? Mm. Hello, hello, yes, 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 thank you. What's my job? I'm a difficult one, secretary. Listen to the pronunciation, I'm a secretary. Next one, let's see, uh -huh. here, this one here. What's my job? I'm a, I'm a conductor. I'm a conductor. All right, and this one, this one here. Mm. I'm a scientist. Again, a difficult pronunciation, scientist. This one here. That's 78 for the chips and then 20 for the chicken. That makes... That'll be 79 euro, madam. Thank you. I'm a cash assistant. A cash assistant. All right. Next one. This one here. Follow me. You see this beautiful monument that we have in the city of Florence is the Duomo. What's my job? I'm a tourist guide. Listen to the pronunciation. I'm a tourist guide. This one, this is difficult. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, I believe that this man is innocent. My job? I'm a lawyer. A lawyer. Next, this one. I'm a, yeah, a painter, a painter, good. And the last one, what do you think this is? Uh, I'm retired. I have no job. I'm retired. So, what's your job? What's your father's job? What's your mother's job? Well, let's look at the screen together and check the spelling and the pronunciation of the jobs we've just looked at. All right, so here's the screen. Good. The question is, what's your job? So, the first one, I'm a waiter. Where does a waiter work? Exactly, in a restaurant. Next one, I'm a computer technician. Where does he work? 
Exactly. In a company. I'm a policeman. Where does a policeman work? In the police headquarters. Headquarters. All right. Next. I'm a secretary. Pronunciation secretary. Where do I work? In an office. Okay. I'm a conductor. Where do I work? In the theater. In the theater. I'm a scientist. I work in a laboratory. A laboratory. Difficult pronunciation. Next. I'm a cash assistant. I work in a supermarket or in a shop. I'm a tourist guide. I work in a tourist center. I'm a lawyer. I work in a law court. A law court. I'm a painter. I work in a studio. I'm retired. I don't work. I stay at home. Okay? Now, those are the different, some different jobs and professions. Now, let's look at some of the questions that you can ask people about their jobs. Let's look at the screen again. You could ask, for example, do you enjoy, do you like your job? Or you could ask, do you have responsibility in your job? Or what about this? Do you have a good salary? Does your salary reflect your job? Or training, training, education. Do you attend training courses? Another one. This. Do you have promotion prospects? Promotion prospects. Another one, are the working conditions good? Are the working conditions good, like holidays, for example? Then, do you meet a lot of people? Do you meet a lot of people? And one more, is your job creative? Is your job creative? So some of the, those are the questions you can ask in conversation, talking about jobs. Good. Well, that's the end of the first lesson, and I look forward to seeing you in the second. Bye. Hello, and welcome to Business Talk, the program dedicated to talking about business skills and techniques. Today's program is all about brainstorming, a very popular conference technique designed to obtain the maximum number of ideas relating to a specific subject. In a bit, Lucy and I will give a short demonstration so you can see what it is all about. But first of all, what does brainstorming mean? And why is it used? Well, people put their ideas together with the aim of finding a solution to a specific problem. Exactly. It's a group activity. All the members suggest ideas and their contributions then stimulate new ideas. And the first rule is any idea is acceptable. Sometimes it's the most outrageous idea that can help generate a solution to the problem. The ideal number of people for a brainstorming meeting is from three to eight. Too many people could get a bit out of hand. Well, even eight people calling out ideas and making comments could get chaotic. So it's useful to have a facilitator, a person who doesn't contribute but keeps this session on course and records the ideas on a flip chart. And although this is a common technique used in the corporate world, you might be surprised to know that during a brainstorming meeting, all hierarchy and roles disappear. The philosophy behind this strategy is to create a real sense of democracy within the group so that everyone feels their opinions are valued. Now, there are certain principles to follow so that brainstorming works well. But before we look at these, let's do a little brainstorming so you actually see how it works. OK, now there are only two of us and there should really be three or more people in a brainstorming meeting. But this is just to give you an idea. So listen carefully to the language we use. Let's imagine the situation. Our company needs to increase its production space. A brainstorming meeting has been organized to gather some ideas. Let's start. 
How about opening a second factory somewhere? What if we close this factory and open a larger factory out of town? Let's explore the possibility of opening a larger factory for production and keep this space to make the shop bigger. Perhaps we could rent the building next to the factory. Why don't we look into renting part of the building next door? What about sharing a production space with another company? Couldn't we examine the possibility of building a third floor? Let's try to reorganize the space we have. What if we organize four shifts a day instead of three? We could relocate our administrative staff and keep production here. How about keeping the production here and renting some office space for the administrative staff? Would we be able to reorganize the shop floor space? Why don't we try moving all the production to China? We could move part of the production to China. What about closing part of the production line? Couldn't we rethink the production line? How about keeping the production of smaller items here and moving the production of larger items to China? OK, we're going to stop here because we're running out of time, but this process could go on for much longer until enough ideas have been collected. At this point, a short list is made of the best ideas so that they can be carefully evaluated by considering how each one would work in practice. So the aim is to conclude the brainstorming session with one or two good ideas that can be put into action and hopefully solve the problem. Did you notice how we didn't stop to judge or analyze the ideas as they came up? Well, that's because if each idea were to be discussed during the actual brainstorming, the ball would never get rolling and too much time would be wasted. Another thing you may have noticed is that Lucy came up with an idea that had nothing to do with increasing the production space. She suggested working four shifts instead of three, which wouldn't solve the problem of space at all. Yes, remember, all ideas are accepted during the brainstorming process because although an idea may seem silly, it might instigate other ideas that could instead give rise to a solution. Yes, actually, you suggested something interesting after the apparently irrelevant idea I had. Well, I'm afraid our time is up for today. See you soon. Bye-bye. Now, as we said in the program, the language you use to put forward your ideas during a brainstorming session is really important. So what kind of language should you use for brainstorming? Clear, well-structured sentences, for example, are essential for this technique to be effective. And don't use any imperatives or rhetorical language. Remember, the aim is to create democracy within the group, and everyone should feel that their ideas are valued. Do you remember how we make suggestions? Let's. How about? These are the expressions we use in a brainstorming session. These expressions open the way to more suggestions and encourage other members to participate. Let's look at some of the structures we used during our brainstorming session. How about opening a second factory? What if we open a larger factory out of town? Perhaps we could rent the building next to the factory. Couldn't we? Build a third floor. Let's try to reorganize the space we have. Would we be able to reorganize the shop floor space? Why don't we try moving all the production to China? We could move part of the production to China. What about closing part of the production line? Notice how all these suggestions promote group collaboration. Brainstorming is a group activity, so it's important to make everyone feel part of a team. OK, now let's see if you've understood. I'm going to make some suggestions as though I were in a brainstorming meeting. And then we'll see which are tentative suggestions 
and which aren't. Ready? We could rent another factory. Let's build another floor. I think we should close part of the production line. How about moving production to China? Why don't we try relocating the administrative staff? In my opinion, we should open another factory. Couldn't we reorganize the space we have? So, of these seven ideas, two are not actually suggestions. Which two? Yes, the two that started with I think and in my opinion. It's essential that in brainstorming you don't try to assert your own opinion. What's important is to work as a team. Try to limit the use of I and use we instead. It's not easy when English isn't your first language and you probably need to practice a couple of times for it to come naturally. Right this way. And this is Gary. And this is Rachel. Hello. Hi. Pleased to meet you. Rachel is a very important team member at our publishing house. She knows everything about the company. Thanks. She was our first employee in 1985. 1985. <laughs> And she can answer any questions you may have. Okay, Anne, you're in good hands. Have a productive day. <laughs> oh, all right, Anne. Are you ready? Uh, well, Mr. Stevens founded this publishing house in 1985. Oh, just a moment. Okay. Okay. I'm ready now. Our first product was a children's book. It was very successful and sold more than three million copies. We had 20 different translations. Over time, the company changed and diversified. And we have now fiction, cookbooks, and tourist guides. Cookbooks and... Um, I'm sorry. I didn't catch that. Tourist guides. We also have an encyclopedia of history and one of art history. Sometimes we publish economic texts and our catalog with over 10,000 titles makes us one of the most important publishers in the country. We also employ more than 150 people. Is everything clear? Um. Yes, I think so. <laughs> <laughs> okay, as you know, this is Gary. He works in the advertising office where he develops new client contacts and keeps in touch with our authors. Pleasure to meet you, Anne. It's uh, so nice to have such lovely colleagues in this company. <laughs> Fine, Anne. <laughs> okay, let's move from theory to action. Okay. This is your desk. Here's your computer. Mm -hmm. You know how to use one, don't you? Yes. Yes. As I told Mr. Stevens, I'm not... Okay, okay. No need to waste time. Okay. <laughs> um, over there is the fax and the photocopier. Okay. There's a coffee machine in the hall over there. Mm -hmm. But please, few breaks and keep them short. Do you understand? Uh, yes. Excellent, Anne. Get to it. <laughs> oh, good morning, Mr. Chang. Excuse me, I was just rearranging my office. Take a seat, please. Thank you. Thank you. It looks very nice here. Thank you. Well, before we begin to talk about our new product, I would like to give you some information about our company. Speedmaster Spectre is a multinational company which specialises in well-designed, high-tech sporting goods. 
Founded in Los Angeles in 1995, we now have 15 branches worldwide. That's very interesting, Mrs. Lee. How much is your company's revenue? Over the past few years, Speedmaster Spectre's revenue has grown impressively. Today we have a turnover of more than 60 million euros of revenue. Our revenues abroad amount to more than 50% of that total. Very impressive. And uh, what are your target markets? We have product lines for men, women and children with gear covering head to toe. Our brand is synonymous with reliability. Speedmaster Spectre is trusted around the world and we are considered one of the leaders in our sector. Great. So, what can you tell me about this new product? This is a revolutionary new tennis shoe. It's extremely durable thanks to our high quality materials. We're interested in the Southeast Asian market. We believe that these shoes are the right product for that market. And uh, where are they manufactured? Right, that's our strength. We have factories that meet all work standards and regulations in the countries we would like to target. And uh, what is your role, Mrs. Lee? In the past, I was responsible for the Southern European market. Just last week, I took on a new role to test and distribute our products into the Chinese market. It's a very challenging position. That could deliver positive results. Together we can do great things, Mrs. Lee. Well, goodbye, Mrs. Lee. This meeting has been very profitable for both of us. Let's talk soon. Thank you, Mr. Chang. And yes, let's meet again soon. Great. Bye-bye. Now, we just saw Victoria doing a presentation of her company, Spectre, and I would like to look at the questions that we usually ask about companies. Let's look at those together on the screen. So, the first question we usually ask is about the type of company. We say, what type of company is it? For example, a multinational, a private, a public, a family company. Another question we often ask is about the main or the principal activity. So the question would be, what does the company do or what is its main activity? For example, manufacturing or engineering or production. Another question is about the employees. Look at the pronunciation of that. Employees, that's the name for the people that work in a company. So the question could be, how many employees are there? Another question we often ask is about subsidiaries or branches, which are small companies directly linked to the main company. And the question could be, does it have any branches? Does it have any subsidiaries? Another question important for us is the location. Where is the company located or where is the company situated? And then we need to know about the products, the number of products, for example. So we could say, how many products does the company have? Or does it have a large product range? And then the last thing which is very important is the money. And when we talk about the sales, the profit, etc., we talk about turnover or revenue. And the question is, what is the annual turnover or revenue of the company? Okay, so those are typical questions. Now, let's look at some answers. In order to do this, I want to compare Spectre which Victoria works for. And then I want to look at the company that my brother owns because my brother has his own company. He's the owner manager of the company. He's the director, but it's very different to Spectre. So let's look at the difference between them and let's look at the screen. Now, if you can see Spectre is a multinational company, it's a very big company. But 
my brother's company, which is called Decorit, Decorit, is a small family company. Now, Spectre specializes in these, in sports goods, especially these high-tech shoes. But my brother's company, Decorit, produces kitchenware, objects like this. Kitchenware, things for the kitchen. Um, the employees. Now, Inspector, they have 1,500 employees. It's a big company. But in my brother's company, there are only 37 employees. Then the branches. Well, Spectre is a multinational. It has 15 branches and factories abroad. But my brother has only one head office. What about the location? Well, Spectre is located in America, in Los Angeles, but my brother's company is located in Manchester, in England. Then, the product range. Well, Spectre, this company has many products. It has 140 products. But my brother's company only has 20 so far. Then, let's think of the um, turnover. Well, Spectre has a turnover of 60 million euro. My brother has a turnover at the moment of 750,000. But that's not bad. So that's the language that we use when we're talking about companies in general. So next time in the, in the third lesson, we'll talk about something new. And I'll see you then. Bye. Good morning. Ah, so, uh, are you ready? Yes, quite ready. Okay, then let's begin. <clears throat> Hello. Uh, my name is Gary Reynolds from Pilgrim Publishing. May I speak to Mr. Jones? <laughs> Mrs. Jones, how are you? And uh, how is that wonderful apple pie of yours? <laughs> I'm fine, thanks. Certainly, I'll hold. With a wink and a nudge, you can get whatever you want, even imaginary apple pie. This author is too important for us. Right. Hello, Mr. Jones. How are you? I'm fine, thank you. I wanted to know if uh, you are interested in contributing to a new cooking guide that we have to bring out soon. Yes, it's a six-volume collection of recipes to fit the needs of all tastes with a detailed photo guide for preparation and cooking techniques. Ah, and we have to have the materials by the end of next month. Right. Uh, exactly. Uh, sure. Of course. Yes. Uh, excuse me. Uh, could you hold on for a moment? And that's enough. Stop now. I, I can't concentrate. Yes, uh, so, uh, as I said earlier, uh, if you accept, I can send you a copy of the contract that you should sign and return. No, no, I'm, I'm sorry. We can't wait until next Tuesday. Uh, well, I'll have to check with my boss. I need to ask Mr. Stevens if we can organize a meeting for next week. Uh, in the meantime, do you need any prep materials? No, no problem at all. I can send you an email immediately. Okay, goodbye. Uh, it was a pleasure speaking to you. Do you always have to take notes? 
Yes, yes, I do. Um, I, I have to learn as much as I can, and well, there's so much to learn. I, I study my notes every evening. <laughs> what a model colleague. You're, you're so serious, so diligent, and an absolute nut about cleaning. Truly an asset to this company. You're making fun of me. No, no, of course not. It's such a shame. Such beautiful eyes shouldn't only read all the time. <laughs> Come on, Gary, stop it. Uh, let's get back to work. Okay, okay. I, I mustn't pay you any compliments then. So, Ms. Baxter, can you give me the notes from my conversation with Mr. Jones? Okay. So, you said to Mr. Jones that... Oh, I have to start from the beginning, right? And, um, and, calm down. It, it's not an exam. I know what we should do. You should try a telephone call. Me? Mm. Oh, no. Oh, no, 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 no. no I, I'm not ready yet. Sure you are. It's not that difficult. Okay. Okay. Here. Who do we have to call next? Try to call Mr. Clifford. All right. Hello, this is Anne Baxter from Pilgrim Publishing. Please may I speak to Mr. Clifford. Oh, oh, I, I see. All right, all right, thank you very much. Right, goodbye. Well, um, what happened? Well... Come on, tell me. I dialed the wrong number. <laughs> <laughs> Good. Now, let's look at company organization. As I said before, companies are usually divided into departments. So let's look at some different departments in a large organization. For example, you can have human resources. Now, human resources is usually personnel. It's training. Training is like education. And it's wages and salaries, human resources. Another department is finance. Now, in finance, you usually have the areas of purchasing, which is buying things, also customer accounts and other financial services. The next department is production. Now, in this particular department, you have producing the goods, you check the quality, you do the packaging, and you distribute the goods to customers. That's production. And the last one we're going to look at is marketing. And in marketing, you advertise the product and you organize sales. So, here they are. Human resources, finance, production, and marketing. Now it's your turn. I am going to describe some activities in these departments and you must decide which of the department the activity is in. Okay? I'll give you an example. For example, which, which department recruits staff? Recruits, that's a difficult verb, takes on staff. Which one? Human resources, finance, production, marketing. Exactly, human resources. Now, you go. Which uh, department creates an image? Creates an image. Mm. Marketing. Good. Next one. Which department manufactures and produces the goods? Oh, that's easy. Production. All right. Next one, which department, very important, pays salaries? Salaries. 
human resources. Exactly. Next one. Which of these departments packs the goods in boxes and in crates? Which packs the goods? Packaging. Mark, no, marketing, no. Production, exactly. It's production. All right. Next one. Which of these prepares invoices? Now, do you know invoices? Invoices are like the bills that you send to customers or suppliers. Which one? That's a job for finance, exactly. Next one. Which department checks the quality of the goods? The quality? Mm, marketing? No, no. Production, that's it. Good. Next one. Who trains the staff? Who teaches the staff? Who organizes courses? Mm, yeah, human resources, all right? Now, who dispatches the products? Dispatches, that sends the products. Which one? Mm. It is production, actually. It's production. This is easy. Which one designs an advertising campaign? An advertising campaign, obvious. Marketing. Okay. Who does the budget, taxes, and investment. Hmm. Clear, yeah? That's finance. Finance department, taxes. Now, who purchases? That's a difficult verb. Who purchases? That means buys. Who purchases supplies? Who purchases things for the company? Which one do you think? Marketing, production, human resources? Well, actually, it's finance finance. They purchase. And the last one, who plans the method of sales, the method of selling it to the public? Human resources, finance, production, marketing? Marketing. Fantastic. So good. So there you have an idea of four of the most important departments that you find in large organizations. Well, that's all for now and I look forward to seeing you in the next DVD for some more Business English. So goodbye for now. So, Mr. Stevens, may I begin to explain our typographic services? Just a moment, Mr. Richardson. I'm still waiting for our new intern. She has a lot to learn and I think our meeting would be very useful for her. Good morning. I'm sorry I'm late, Mr. Stevens. Never mind, Anne. Anne, this is Mr. Richardson. How do you do? Good morning. Anne, I see you've had your hair done. Very nice. Oh, thank you, Mr. Stevens. <clears throat> it looks like you were out late last night. I hope you had fun. Were you at a party or perhaps a club? Oh, no. I was at home. Actually, um... It was quite a difficult night, and um, anyway, um, I don't want to bore you with my personal problems. Right. So, Mr. Richardson, tell us about your typographical services. Then. Founded by Charles Emerson, Montex has been active in the typographic market since 1985. From the beginning, we have been known for our innovation and high-quality products. Mr. Emerson's children, John and Lucy, have continued the tradition by improving and enlarging the family business. The first Montex office was located in Russell Street. Oh, Russell Street! That's where the flower market is. I went there just the other day and bought two beautiful yellow orchids. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Mr. Richardson, I, I didn't mean to interrupt you. <clears throat> um, as I was saying, over the years and um, following changes in the market, our company has diversified and extended its line of products. We've purchased the latest technology, offering our customers the best package available on the market today. In 2000, we moved to a larger office space in order to improve production. Our new headquarters are located in Rodney Road. 
and we have approximately 55,000 square metres at our disposal. Well, that's a huge space. Yes, that's right. Uh, it's very big. Anyway, our first success was with um, brochures, marketing flyers, pamphlets and company catalogues. We also provided business cards and general printing services. Over time, we moved into book publishing as digital technology and expansions in the market gave us the skills to enter the market. Currently, we're equipped to provide highest quality publishing at an extremely competitive price. Our current capacity is more than 100 million pages per year. So, Anne, have you understood everything? Would you like to sum up what Mr. Richardson has said? Me? Yes. Could you? Oh, um, all right. I'll try. <clears throat> Established in 1985 by Charles Emerson, Montex has successfully grown and adapted to changing client needs. In 2000, the company transferred to Rodney Road, where, thanks to cutting-edge equipment capable of high volume, it has optimised its production and extended its offerings, specialising in the publishing sector. Currently, it provides top-quality printing at extremely attractive pricing. Well done, Anne. You have a great ability to summarise. <laughs> You know, Mr. Richardson, we aren't very pleased with our current typographers. They don't meet deadlines. Professionalism, efficiency and punctuality are the keys to our success. Do you know that in just a few years, the number of Montex clients has grown by 100%. And what sort of printing do you principally use? Digital printing and offset printing in the case of high density needs. What? Offset printing? Young lady, you work for a publishing house and you don't know what offset printing is? Um, no, sir. I'm afraid I don't. Is it important? And offset printing is the classic way in which a graphic project done on a computer is converted to the final printed page. I get it. I get it. Well, it is important. It's extremely important. Mm -hmm. What an idiot I must seem. <laughs> I, I basically told you I have no technological know-how. You know, Mr. Stevens, I, I am studying the editor's manual that you gave me, but, but I, I haven't got to the letter O yet. <laughs> <laughs> So in that scene, you saw Mr. Richardson talking about the history of his company. Now, to help you understand the language, I would like to talk to you about my brother, because he has a company of his own, which he opened in 1993. And it's really interesting, because one day when he was in a cafe with a friend of his, he had an idea. They were sitting at a table and between them they had an object, something like this. It was transparent with petals inside it. And he thought, well, wouldn't it be fantastic if they could fix that idea? So what he did is he designed a prototype. This is the example. And he made the first prototype of pexiglass and you can see Inside, there are real natural objects in the plexiglass. Then he did some market research to see if people would like objects like this. And he found some potential customers. So then he looked for some suppliers, people who would sell him the plexiglass. Then he needed the money. So he asked some banks for financial support and he set up or he established a company. He formed a partnership with his friend 
And then he invented a name. Now, the name of the company is Decorit. So it's Decor, which is like decoration, eat, which is eat, Decorit. Then he rented an office. He hired a secretary for administration and he launched the first product. Now, that was, that was in 1993. And the company has now developed a lot. And let's look on the screen because it's interesting. When you talk about company history, you, you use the simple past tense. But when you talk about how a company develops, we move into the present perfect. Now, let's look at the screen and see how my brother's company has developed. Well, the company has grown. It has expanded. And the sales has increased a lot. Sales have increased a lot. Now, they needed more people, so they took on, they have taken on new staff. Probably about seven or eight new people. Then equipment. They have purchased new equipment because there's more production. Then the product range has developed. It has diversified. So you have more types of product than before. This was the prototype. And these are other examples. This plate here is another example of the products they have developed. So product range has developed. Then the client base. Well, they have increased now and they have more distributors. That's good. The market now has extended from England to the whole of Europe. And as you see, investment, they have invested more in advertising and promoting the products. Then they've moved to bigger offices. The premises are much larger. And they have opened a subsidiary in France. So the company is doing really well. So that's some of the language to talk about company history and how a company expands. Good. That's the lesson for now. And I look forward to seeing you in the next one. Bye. We're meeting here today to show Mr. Chang our new Smarty tennis shoes. These innovative shoes are made of high quality materials and are perfect for the Southeast Asian market, which, as we all know, is expanding rapidly. We're especially interested in the Chinese market, which is growing at a pace much faster than the rest of the world. Excuse me for a moment. Henry? Hi. I'm sorry, but I'm in a meeting right now. Let's talk later, OK? All right, tell me, but hurry up. No, Henry, I never told John he could watch TV all day. He must have misunderstood. All I said was that he can watch all the TV he wants, but only after doing his homework. <clears throat> um, this really isn't the right moment, Henry. I'm sorry, can we continue this conversation later on this evening? Pardon the interruption. Now, as I was saying... Excuse me, Victoria, but do you think this is the right product for the Chinese market? I think that before we export smart in the Southeast Asia market, we need to take a close look at the local competition and the market's tasters in the sector. Excellent observation, Paul. We've actually already done market research. And as Mr. Chang can confirm, demand for sporting goods in China has grown by 50% over the past 10 years. Far Eastern consumers are increasingly interested in the latest fashion. They have become the most demanding consumers of fashion and quality in the world. Isn't that right, Mr. Chang? Oh, yes. Your fashions have reached our shores. Fashion is law, especially for young consumers. In fact, purchases are driven more by trends than by the actual products. And what about the competition, Victoria? It's a well-known fact that labor costs are lower in China and the shoes produced in China are much more cost-competitive than in Europe. Right again, Paul. However, our shoes are manufactured with high-quality materials. 
that target an upper level segment of the market. This market segment is quite happy to spend more on products that are well equipped, last longer and are of a higher quality. Do you have any data on how smart essays are going in Europe and in the States? Yes. Our marketing department sent me the latest report just this morning. And I'm happy to say it's very encouraging. Smarty has become one of our most successful products of the last few years. Demand is growing exponentially and the satisfaction level of these shoes is much higher than that of similar shoes produced by other companies. In fact, Smarty shoes are considered one of the most durable, the most functionable and, most importantly, the most popular amongst the youth market. And what about the distribution? It's a very important aspect that we shouldn't underestimate. Yes, Mr Chang is here to help clarify this issue for us. It is extremely important to have a detailed distribution and promotion plan. We've also got to create a reputable chain of agents to distribute our products over the widest possible area. This, in turn, will help us make importation easier and reduce taxes for entry into the Chinese market. Look, I'm very happy to provide you with any information you may need, as well as contacts inside the Ministry of Industry and the Chamber of Commerce. But, of course, success depends on your goals, your strategy, and the type of uh, financing plan you're willing to provide. And besides that... Oh, excuse me yet again. John, what do you want? I told Dad I'm in an important meeting. No, John, I didn't say that. First do your homework and then you can watch TV, OK? And listen, listen to me. I don't care if your friends aren't studying today just because it's a holiday tomorrow. Do you understand? Tomorrow we're going to see your grandparents, so you have to study today. That's enough of this story, John. No, that's not true. I'm a good mother and I love you, but it doesn't mean I don't have the right to tell you what to do. Listen, I don't want to talk about this anymore. Goodbye. Pardon me, just a little domestic problem. Oh well, yes, Mrs Lee. We all know that kids cause more problems than work. Ah, uh, you're right, Mr Chang. Kids, anyone who understands them is a genius. <laughs> so in that scene, there were some examples of the language we use when we talk about markets. To help us understand that language more, let's go to the computer and see it. So... If a company wants to go into a new market, we talk about it as entering a market or even penetrating a market. Now, if a market has been there for a while, we say that the market is established or it's well established. But often, markets change. If they improve, we talk about the market situation growing or increasing. But if the opposite happens, we say that the market shrinks. It's shrinking or it's decreasing. However, if we find a change which is uneven, we say that the market is fluctuating, that it's changing. Or if there is no change, we talk about the market as being stable. If the market is full and there is no more room to promote or sell your product as a company, we say that the market is saturated. So those are the typical words that we use when we describe markets. Now, also in the scene that we saw with Victoria, they talked a lot about China and Europe, the difference between the two areas. Now, China is... A, an important country which is coming up. And what I'd like to do now is to revise the um, comparatives and superlatives, in particular the comparatives, and look at the difference between those two markets, Europe and China. Let's look at the screen to help us. 
here. Now, if we think about market growth, in general, market growth in China at the moment is faster. In Europe, it's slower. Labor costs. Labor costs, what's that? That is the cost of people, people working. Well, in China, as we know, the labor costs are definitely lower. In Europe, they're higher. What about market demand? Well, at the moment, the demand for new products and services in China is much greater than in Europe. In Europe, it's less. Production costs, another thing, well, it's cheaper to produce in China also because labor costs are lower. In Europe, it's more expensive. So many companies are moving to China for that reason. How about production time? Well, usually it's much shorter. It takes less time to produce in China than it does in Europe where it's longer. But what about high tech? Well, usually high tech in China is less advanced than it is in Europe. Europe is still more advanced. That might change though. And then design. Well, I would say that in China, the situation is more traditional. Uh, whereas in Europe, uh, we are still more innovative. We're more innovative. So that's an example of how you can compare different world markets. Great. Well, thank you, and I'll see you in the next lesson for something new. Bye.